So I've been playing Lost Eidolons, because you have no time to game. <laughs> Before we start, I just want to let you know what when the credits roll means. Basically, in a world that doesn't have the greatest trust in journalism or content creators, to add a bit of credibility to what I do, I'll only review a game once I've played it through to the credits. And I'll do my best to get like a screenshot or whatever of that and put it on my Twitter or anything just to show it off. To, to like, again, help with the credibility. Hopefully this gives you a little bit of confidence in the review going forward. So. What we have is a modern indie tactics game that has dropped the 2D sprite work for a very competent 3D graphics. But is Lost Island a game of the year contender or a modern style flop? It was released on the 13th of October 2022 from Ocean Drive Studios on Steam. And for me, it took about 45 hours to see the credits roll. So it's not the shortest of games. Set on the continent of Artemisia, the, this continent has been in a massive upheaval as a recent war of the Empire has conquered the lands and is imposing harsh controls on all the smaller countries involved in the continent. But there's a seeming possibility of the Emperor being ill or even dying and rebellion is brewing once more. In the country of Benerio, under the rule of Artemisia and the Empire, we take on the role of Eden, a leader of a small mercenary band that has a bit of an issue where they tend to do the right thing as opposed to the most profitable thing. Not the most mercenary ideal there. And because of this issue, it's not long before they get embroiled in the rebellion against the Empire, joining Isoro Fenice and his nephew Balastar in their attempt to overthrow their oppressors. But everything is not as it seems though, and can Eden bring his little merry crew through the continent spanning war and politics? As we see this story in the game is quite complex, with lots of machinations, politics driving it. But at its heart is a story of a small mercenary band of Edens and how they grow and adapt to the situation way above their pay grade. The characterizations of many of the char of the, the characterization of many of the people for such a large game is very surprising. And I find myself loving and hating characters and desiring to know more about them. It's a sort of game where many will have different experiences based on the characters they focus more on and learn about. I'm generally impressed with the level of detail even many of the smallest of side characters have. Lost Eidolon's story is a very interesting beast. It has very little downtime, as we can see in some of the big tactics games, where they tend to like meander around in the middle a bit, stalling for time to extend the gameplay or something. Oh no, this game keeps pushing and pushing, and genuinely kept me wanting to see what was going to happen next. And what happens next is the gameplay. So Lost Eidolons is divided into two sections, a classic tactics battle system and a camp section. Before we get into the battles, let's have a look at the camp. In the camp, so the camp, unlike a lot of games, actually has a fully realized environment, not just a selection of menus. And you can wander around it and watch it grow as your army gets bigger. But the main point of it is to engage in conversation with your buddies and other camp affiliates. Your allies will have four levels of conversations available. The first is they have nothing to say. Second, they'll have a little comment about the current events or just some tidbit about their relationships, etc. Uh, these conversations are shown with like a little speech mark icon. Up next, we have the side quests denoted by question mark. And these are usually go through a series of conversations around the camp with different people resolving small issues and usually might to just get to know our people better. And occasionally we'll have to explore the camp looking for lost items for the person in question. And next we have the main quest conversations and these, as you probably guess, will continue story for us once you've done all the chatting involved. You have some other bits to take care of. Firstly, visiting one of the three merchants, one which sells you potions, one which sells base weapons, and the last one that isn't always around but sells rare weapons, armors, and gift items. You'll then want to visit the prestige board. This is uh, more little side quests, and they usually like simply as talking to a character in a specific way, or killing enemies, etc in an option of battle usually. Doing these will increase our prestige, which increases, as it increases, gives us more leadership. Now leadership is important as it's a consumable resource for us to use with building ties with our buddies. As each character has a friendship level, also increasing prestige lets us occasionally send troops out to help the local villagers for a small reward at the cost of a little bit of the leadership value for that time. Leadership also refreshes after every main battle. Now that we can spend our leadership, 
on, well, there are several additional ways we can talk to characters. The aura is on the same thing, increasing our rapport with that character, but are done in different settings, whether that be training, a war room, over food, or looking after horses. You just, you are given a topic of conversation that in, the amount available increases as the game goes on. These result in some sort of scene between Eden and that ally, giving you even more backstory about the characters. You can also spend leadership to give your buddies gifts. Each character has a preference that they like and giving them the correct item or rarer items increase their rapport a bit or a lot. Now, what does increasing the rapport with all the characters do? Firstly, it unlocks more conversation with that person. And secondly, reaching a certain rapport with a camp is to give you the chance to actually recruit them. There are still two more things you can do in the camp. And this is hold an appointment ceremony, which is just a fancy way of showing off your class upgrades. And the second is setting up a training for your characters that after each story mission, they'll gain a bit of extra experience in specific attributes that you've selected. For Ethan himself, this happens by spending leadership to have a mock battle with an ally. And these mock battles are really simple. They just hit backwards and forwards and then you have a small QTE event usually. While doing all this, you're managing your characters by going into the menu and doing a bunch of stuff. So the menu area has the classic stuff, seeing your character who are made of pretty much of the usual statistics that you would expect. They also have levels in specific attributes, such as weapon types, magic types, armor types. Select their class, which is an interesting little setup. You can change your classes freely, but you do have to meet certain requirements to actually unlock said classes, which usually involve having your weapons, magic, or armor attributes to a certain level. And then the later classes will also be locked behind certain parts of the game. But what do classes provide? Well, that is a set of skills, and some of which you can get permanently when you max the class. These lead us on to the skill system. I honestly barely touch this. You get a bunch of active skills from your characters and character specific ones. And there are some you can slightly change and mod your character's build, but I honestly didn't feel much need to mess with it. Don't forget as well to equip your characters. Each character has a selection of items they can equip as in primary or offhand weapons with mages taking grimoires instead. And some later classes having all three. When you equip a grimoire though, you also need to select its spells it carries. Um, again, as you advance in the levels, you can take more spells. They can also wear one of three types of armor, cloth, leather, or plate, and take three potions with them. I pretty much only ever used health potions, <laughs> if I'm honest. There were other types of potions, though, like ones where you could set poison clouds or fire or whatever, all sorts. You also have the classic quest tracker and a cool little map of the camp, which you can use to teleport around. The last thing you can do in the camp is partake in optional battles. One of the weakest elements of the game, actually as they are incredibly repetitive. But hey, it's an extra fight and extra experience. So yeah, the menu also has some extra little tidbits like character backgrounds and all that sort of jazz that you'd expect in these sort of games. So now we're going into the battles themselves. Firstly, you set up your formation of 10 peeps, which everyone can then also assign an aid when if you have more than 10 characters. Aids give a small buff to the character that they are aiding and they also gain some of the XP. You unlock aids, like I said, when you get more than 10 buddies at your disposal. The actual battles are your classic Fire Emblem style, literally, like Fire Emblem style, literally. Tactics gameplay on a square grid. The quirks of this one possessed though are the elemental effects, such as water conducts electricity, where you all can freeze. Fire can burn bushes and such. It's a classic I go, you go style, where you move all your troops in order, in any order you want to unleash their basic attacks, magics and special skills all of which have limited uses, apart from the basic attack. You can use an item or even switch between your primary and secondary weapon if you bought them, which is a neat little feature as bows make for a great secondary weapon, giving some range to your melee characters. The spells come in three flavors, elemental magic, which deals damage and is previously mentioned elemental effects, dark magic, which has all sorts of status effects, such as silent and sleep, and light magic, which focuses on healing, the missions themselves tend to be pretty basic with the traditional kill all or get to a certain spot or survive, but the varied map design and the enemies and allies popping onto the map at scripted points makes it feel varied. The enemies also have a couple of quirks. Firstly, you'll have bosses. These are denoted by a crown and you can't actually hurt them much at all until you've dealt with all their minions surrounding them. Then you have monsters. This is the bit that takes a big step away from Fire Emblem. The monsters provide a more unique fight with them having a certain type of weakness to a specific weapon or magic that changes each round and you have to hit their weaknesses 
on that turn to build up a critical counter, causing the characters in question to do more and more damage as the critical counter goes up. These fights, especially when you have normal people involved as well <laughs> as the monsters, provide some of the quite interesting tactical decisions. Do you take out all the little dudes? Do you take out the monsters, which can do heavy damage? It makes for a lot of choices. And choices, choice in these type of games is king. There's also a weapon triangle that's based on certain weapons doing more damage to specific armor types on top of everything. Overall, the battles are fun and have enough variety to keep you going. So, what's good? Well, I was totally stalled on the story. I loved all the various beats and themes it provides. It has a solid rags to riches through war story, but it's truly the characters that make it. And as you heard before, there's a lot of ways to interact with characters and really build them up to the point you can feel for them. Some of them you will love, some you will hate, just like any good story, story should make you feel about characters. This is all wrapped up in a very good rendition of the Fire Emblem battle template. And it's one I've enjoyed more than many Fire Emblem games. And I say yeah, Fire Emblem because it's, that's where it wears that inspiration on its sleeve. But no game is perfect. And in this case, first we have the optional battles. These really could have done with a bit more variety on this aspect as they are very repetitive. Something I didn't mention fully above is allies in some battles. You'll have people helping you and they are dumb as rocks. Strong as wet tissue paper and it's a shame. I would like to see this area fleshed out a bit more and make me not hate them in most battles. <laughs> the last time I won't spoil anything, but I feel the balance of the final battle was a little wacky as I had to completely change my tactics and take a bunch of characters and classes I hadn't been using up to that point just to kind of cheese it a bit. As always, before my final thoughts, what did the critics think? Currently on Metacritic, it sits at 75 from the critics and an 81.1 from the users or an 81 from the users. And I am more on side of the users score here as this is a brilliant game that deserves any praise it receives. Yes, it isn't flawless, but the flaws are more than manageable. And as you probably guessed, I really enjoyed this game as a wonderful cast of characters wrapped in a solid story and the gameplay feels like a solid love letter to the tactics genre and a progression in visuals from an indie team having a solid 3D graphics as opposed to the normal 2D sprite work we're used to seeing. So my rating is must play.